Hello and welcome to episode 106 of the world's first Paul Weller fan podcast. I'm Dan Jennings and 10 years ago I gave up my life stream and career as a radio presenter with one big regret. Never getting to interview my hero, the legendary British musician Paul Weller. This podcast exists purely to solve that issue. Welcome to Desperately Seeking Paul. And in this episode, I'm joined by a musician, bassist, band leader, and songwriter, Yolanda Charles. As a professional bass player for 30 years, she has played with the likes of Mick Jagger, Dave Stewart, Robbie Williams, Sinead O'Connor, Hans Zimmer, Squeeze, and of course, Paul Weller. We'll hear how a chance encounter via Jonathan Ross led to Yolanda joining the Paul Weller band for the Wildwood tour, with recordings captured for Paul's first solo live album, Livewood, released in September 1994. She performed on the singles Hung Up, Out of the Sinking, and You Do Something to Me, and continues to play in the live band through the Stanley Road and Heavy Soul periods too. So we'll talk all about her musical journey throughout that time period, her latest band, Project PH, and even on working with Hans Zimmer on the Oscar award-winning Dune soundtrack. This is another very special episode, so let's get into it. Yolanda Charles, thanks for joining me. Thanks for inviting me. Now, look, um, you're a proper musician. I can tell this because so far you're the only musician who's joined us on the podcast clutching their instruments. <laughs> well, yeah, I was up quite early this morning. Uh, I have a gig tonight. I was trying to get some last minute practice in because it's all very challenging stuff. So I need to keep up, you know, my boys, they're really, really skilled, you know. I love it. I love it. Well, look, we can maybe you can play us some riffs as we go through this. This would be lovely. <laughs> <laughs> But hey, look, I'm really chuffed to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. So many of the fans have talked about wanting to get you on. So I'm delighted that we've managed to secure you for this one. This is great. Great. We're going to talk about Paul and your links with Paul, but we'll talk about all kinds of things, your career, your music, what you're up to now as well, which sounds really exciting as well. So we'll talk about all this kind of stuff. But from a Weller point of view, when was it you first became aware of Mr. Weller's music? I was a kid, you know, obviously. I used to watch Top of the Pops religiously like everyone else, you know, because even though there wasn't often music that I was really into on the show, occasionally you get Shalimar or something and I'd be really excited, you know. <laughs> but um, yeah, I used to watch it. I used to talk about it at school if it was a good, good performance. It was, it was a talking point, you know, when I was a kid. I miss that about popular culture now. It's so wide, you know, there's such a variety of stuff that people are narrowly focused, not so widely focused. So we can't share the same experiences, which is a shame. But yeah, Paul's music, but Style Council though, more, not really the jam. And did you get to see them live at any point? Uh, no, I never used to see live gigs. We didn't go out like that when I was young. I wasn't really taken anywhere like that. And then when I did go to things, I went to the Reggae Sunsplash or, you know, like an, a festival thing that I could just see more than one band. I never really went to gigs until I started to form really strong tastes in um, specific areas. And then I was working like a paper tickets, you know, that sort of thing. And was that the, the, the bass that you're clutching there? Was that your first instrument? Was that the first love from a music point of view and creating your own music? Well, first love, yes, but not the first instrument. I've tried a few before. <laughs> Had a recorder, clarinet, trumpet, yes. Uh, <laughs> still pans, other than still pan orchestra at my school. That was wicked. And bass, a guitar then after that. And then I just used to pick out bass lines on the guitar. So obviously I wasn't a guitarist. But and my guitar teacher spotted that and said, oh, you're a bass player. And I was like, oh, am I? Okay. <laughs> you say so, really yeah. Yeah, then I realised I was a bass player, yeah. And that was about age 15 or so. Ah, and was it, is it a musical family that you come from? Was there anything that suggested that this would be your way of life? Maybe if you were in my house, you'd go, you're going to probably be a musician because all we, we just played music constantly in terms of like records. And my dad was a massive, massive music fan, music lover, but never played any instruments. Neither did my mum. My sister and brothers didn't either. So no one played an instrument. I, I used to just keep bringing home various instruments. They'd be like, what have you got this time? You know, <laughs> oh, oh, I think it's a clarinet. No, it's a trumpet. <laughs> I, just, I kept trying stuff out because I just loved it. I loved playing, you know. And uh, so, yeah, listening to records, I think, made us, made me play an instrument. And what was the music in your house? You mentioned your dad's like a big, big music lover. What was the music that was getting played? Well, it's kind of a mix. Dad had his kind of side of the fence and mum had hers. Mum was Blue Beat, Scar, Bob Marley. She liked some pop. She liked a little bit of ABBA, which I found a bit, <laughs> oh no, no. <laughs> Can't be with the ABBA thing. And your dad's side of the fence then? He liked the crooners, so he liked Nat King Cole, Frank Sinatra. He had, um, actually mum, funnily enough, mum had Buddy Rich and Gene Krupa albums, which I found very interesting. You know, these drummers, you know, taking these long solos in these big bands, kind of 
Dad was into his crooners when it came to jazz. Didn't really have a lot of jazz in the house. There's no Miles Davis or anything like that. But there was um, the sort of uh, 50s swinger type style. And then Dad was into his funk. So James Brown, big time. He used to get up and try and do his mashed potato. <laughs> yeah, wow. Dad, business. what are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> mashed potato. I was like, oh my God. But yeah, he was just loved it. It was just joyful when he, he got into music. And because he was into it and being a guy, I suppose, he got into the stereo, you know. So he had this really pucker amplifier that no one was allowed to touch, you know. I was taught how to put a record on, you know, I couldn't just put a record on. I was given a, a lesson how to handle the vinyl. That's a care for it, yeah. Dropping the needle. And if my dad heard the needle drop be too heavy, I'd get in trouble. So I had to be really <laughs> careful. It's like I was sort of shaking, you know, trying to get this thing to just be silent. Then he'd go, there's dust, there's dust, get the rubber out. I was like, oh, sorry, I'm just reminiscing about my dad and his... This is brilliant. No, this, will, this will connect with so many people. So many people have had this same experience. It's like, this <laughs> thing's precious. <laughs> it was. I know I remember having to clean the dust off the, the whole thing. And But yeah, I mean, it was all about love of music and respecting the musicians, respecting the records. And I was definitely raised around that right. atmosphere. So maybe that... I don't know, could have fed into my, my general love of music, I think. Yeah. And what was the first band? When was that? So was that around that age, like 15, 16? Uh, yeah, not long after. Yeah, I was about 17. I went to a youth club. I hate secondary school, apart from my music teacher was lovely to me, really kind. I think he spotted that I was a little bit of a lost soul and she took me under his wing a little bit and let me play instruments and be a bit away from everyone and go in the music room alone and stuff like that. And I used to just find instruments like that. And then when I left school, I didn't really have any direction, but somebody said, oh, we should check out the youth club at the local sixth form centre. So I did that, joined a band there with people much older than me, and they took me under their wing again, which is great because I had a lot to learn. I'd only been playing for about two years. And uh, the guitarist, Patrick, basically helped helped part of my development as a bass player, kind of, you know, in terms of what, what was cool and what wasn't cool, you know. Mm. But I actually had some formal lessons at the youth club uh, from somebody who knew what they were doing so they could tell me how to hold the bass properly. But then Patrick gave me the experience of that, about how to actually play music, which is not lessons, it's different kind of experience. So I was in a really good place to be at that Six One Centre. You often see, you mentioned Top of the Pops, and Top of the Pops, yeah. they'd be scanning around and it's often the front person... And then the, we get quite a bit of zooming in on the drummer often, but sometimes the bass player gets a bit kind of sidelined from the visuals, from the videographer. So who are you looking up to as a, your kind of idols in that space? Well, all the music that I listened to pretty much apart from the jazz stuff was all bass led. So it was in the music, reggae, you know, there's a lot of reggae yeah. going on. My brother was into his reggae and all, all of the facets of reggae, you know, so many different types of reggae. Soul, funk, R&B, old school R&B. Less bass led in the R and B, but you know. Well, yeah, a lot of that, a lot of that. This yeah. the bass that's driving the the sound yeah. forward, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Temptations, all that sixty stuff, the Motown stuff, classic bass on that, and then eighties Luther Vandross and Change and I don't know Alexandra O'Neill or whatever. All those tunes had a lot of really great bass riffs on it. I was surrounded by bass, but I never fixated on a specific player because. There wasn't visuals around so much. We didn't get any magazines in our house. I know they were around, but I never used to have any idea what the people that I liked looked like because I used to buy 12-inch for the singles. I didn't want to buy the 7-inch. Some of those covers didn't have any artwork on them. Do you remember that? Just like yeah. black or just... Yeah, just like a crap, crap paper sleeve, yeah. I know. Yeah, do you remember that? I was yeah. kind of worried remembering that now, actually, because I didn't really buy albums. I, I chose, my music was always oriented around which track was the banging track on the records. So I'd, I'd only ever buy one or two singles or really, if they released some 12 inches. In them. So I didn't know what they looked like, these artists. So I didn't know what the bass player looked like. There was no internet, of course. So, you know, it was always great because if I, any of those bands were on top of the pops, I'd get to see what they looked like for yeah. the first time. All <laughs> 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 right, there you go. So, yeah, I didn't really fixate on a, on a musician. It was always just whichever bass line is fattest, deepest, has the sickest pocket, that's my favourite track. It doesn't really matter who's playing it or what the artist is. If the bass is killing then that's my tune. So yeah. I was definitely oriented towards bass, you know, just naturally. Nice, nice. Now, Mr. Weller is a fan of the bass because I think it was his first instrument that was the bass. He was initially playing that in the jam before they moved things around and stuff. Your time with the Weller band, so this is 93, you joined the yeah. Paul Weller band, right? So the Star Council has come to an end. He's had that first solo album and we're into Wildwood. So I'm guessing you joined for the Wildwood tour. Would that be right? Yes. And how did that come about? How did they find you? The band between 
him just using his own name. What was that called? It was the oh, the Paul Weller movement. Yeah, movement. I guess. Yeah, that yeah. was um, with Camille yeah. Hines and that band with, of course, Whitey. They were on Jonathan Ross show. I think it might have. What song they played? Did uh, oh, I nearly had it. Weaver, maybe. Oh, okay, yeah. And I was in the house band for the Jonathan Ross show. I was 21. It was an all-girl band and I was really miffed that it was an all-girl band because I wanted to be taken seriously and I kept getting put with the girls. And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> I'm not a girl, I'm a bass player. Why do you keep putting me with girls, you know? But the band was a good band, so it didn't matter in the end. But I, I was always worried that the standard wouldn't be as high because there's so few of us around to pick from, you know, that could play. So I was in this house band and um, Paul was a guest on with the movement. I guess he'd seen me play and we did, that day he was on, I was lucky because most of the music we were playing wasn't all that great. A lot of the time it was whatever, you know, sort of eye dense, you know, little bits of music. Yeah, yeah. But we had Candy Dolfer on that show. So we ended up playing Pick Up The Pieces because she did a, a cover of it. Oh, cool. So, of course, the bass is kind of funky in that tune. And that's the only time I ever really played anything vaguely funky on the on the whole show. We did 13 episodes. But that particular one, Paul saw me playing something that had a bit of pocket in it. I don't really remember how long the gap was, but I did get a call. I didn't speak to him. I watched their performance. I didn't speak to anyone. I had no idea that he'd, he'd checked out what I'd been playing. And I got a call from his dad about coming and having a play. And I was just like, what? What? You know? <laughs> Is it scary? <laughs> I'd done something for um, Jimmy Somerville at that point already. So I had a little bit of an experience of working, not really as a proper session musician, but I'd done a name artist and done some TV and when I was quite young, when I was 19, you know. So I had a little bit of experience, but then it all sort of went, I was going to say T-I-T-S up, but it's all right, isn't it? So you can say what you like, yeah, it's fine. Yay! Well, it went wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, with, with Jimmy, because I had a tour booked with him and then it all sort of fell apart. So from sort of going from working in Sainsbury's, which I was doing at the time, getting a tour with Jimmy Somerville, it getting cancelled. And then I found myself back working in shops again. It was a bit of a sort of come down. So I wasn't really thinking oh, my career was about to kick off. And then this um, audition came up for the Jonathan Ross show, which I obviously won. And then that's when I, when I met Paul. And then that's when I was, when Paul contacted me and I started working with him. That was really the beginning of my sort of so-called session career was yeah. uh, it started then. Because I had my full start, you know. But yeah, it was from the show. Man, that's wicked. What a great story. I remember that performance on Jonathan Ross, actually. I'm going to have to dig that out as well. Fabulous. And so what, John John invites you down to Solid Bond, I'm guessing, yeah. to the studio, and no, you get to meet the team and all that? Yeah. Oh, No Miss, was it? Was it No Miss? Yeah, I'm not sure. I think they had an office in there at that point. So yeah. Maybe right. they didn't, but yeah, it was at No Miss. I'd never been. I had a, yeah, I had been there with Jimmy, actually. So, I, like, I hadn't been, I wasn't completely green, but I kind of was, you know? Yeah. Um. So I learned a lot of stuff through Paul that some of it was a little bit tricky <laughs> uh, but necessary though but difficult as well because I was so new I was only 22 when I started working for him quite funny as well right because I'd done Jimmy and I'd done uh, the Jonathan Ross show and when we got one of our first reviews about something Steve Craddock was in the band as well and he was older than me by maybe half a year or even a year or something but in this article, they described his new band as the young, bright-eyed Steve Craddock and session veteran Yolanda Charles. And I was like, <laughs> You're 21. You're making me sound like a freaking Dame, Dame Yolanda. <laughs> I mean, Craddock yeah. did look about 12 years old from all the pictures well, around that time, didn't he? But yeah, that was ridiculous. <laughs> it was funny. So, um, yeah, I, I already had, people already had this perception that I'd been around for a while, you know, it was quite funny. I think the first TV programs I'd done was 17 years old through the college that I uh, attended. So maybe people thought they'd see me around a lot already. And, you know. I don't think you can be a veteran. Like, it's funny you want to say, really. <laughs> That's <laughs> hilarious. I was very green and it was an amazing experience working with Paul in so many ways. Well, you get to travel the world. You get to perform all these amazing songs. You get to play on singles and albums and stuff. So we'll dig into some of these memories as well. So let's talk about that Wildwood tour. So, I mean, Paul is back on top. He's selling huge amounts of records. Wildwood, then Stanley Road and stuff. It's interesting, actually, because at that time, you know, when you talk about the movement, he started playing like the Jam and the Style Council and some new solo stuff to pad out the set and revisit those songs. But from that Wildwood period onwards up to Heavy Soul, he wasn't really digging back into the jam and the style cuts. So did you get to play any of those Bruce Foxton riffs at all from the jam or any of that stuff? Or was it all Paul Weller solo? I, I never played a single one 
of no. any of his back catalogue. It was all just the eponymous album and then Wildwood and then after that, Stanley Rose and then Heavy Soul. Yeah, and he wasn't particularly into that. So so you might have done a few covers, I think, around that time, didn't you? But, but yeah, no, yeah, nothing from did. the back catalogue. Oh, that's a shame. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I wasn't really from that background, you know, that kind of pop rock British rock background. And so it was really tough for me at the beginning because I came from, I've, I've kind of gone full circle now I'm back where I, I started off when I was 19, but I was coming from the soul funk acid jazz territory. So when Paul invited me and I was in a band called Raw Stylus and in another band called Urban Species, and we were playing kind of rap, like acid jazz kind of stuff and funk based a little bit, you know. So I had no experience playing rock and pop. Even the Jimmy Somerville thing was a reggae cover, you know, so it was all new to me. So I wasn't really that mournful about not playing any jam because I had never listened to it. Uh, so I was more familiar with the more soulful stuff. And then, you know, Above the Clouds and those kind of tunes were, were right up my street. And then he started to get more, a slightly more rocky as time went on. And I had to learn how to do that with in his band, you know, yeah. and it was the best school, the best education for learning how to do it. Because um, he would say to me, you know, talk to me about bands like uh, Small Faces and Free. I never heard of these bands. I never listened to them. You know? <laughs> so then now I'm listening to them, I'm listening to Andy Fraser and checking out his style of bass playing. That really influenced my bass playing in Paul's band because I realised how Andy was playing was so expressive, very musical. And it used to use the whole neck, you know, and uh, swoop about a lot, you know, because people don't um, associate the rock and pop stuff with sort of having to have any chops particularly, unless they're mm. sort of going, oh, John Entwistle, you know, or um, Norman Watt or someone. Another absolute legend. Yeah, Ian Drury and the Blockheads, right? So, yeah, and those those two, very technically, obviously John Entwistle being, you know, having his own particular yeah. technique and being a bit special on the bass, and then Norman Watt was particularly you know, dexterous with his right hand and all that. But most of the time people assume that playing rock and pop is quite simple, especially compared to jazz and funk, which because jazz and funk is technically often quite difficult. I realised that the subtlety of getting playing rock correctly or playing it with the right kind of approach and attitude, it took a whole different level of technique and skill that I just didn't have. Right. So I might have had some speed with my left hand or something, but I didn't have the sort of, you know, chutzpah sort of musculature that sort of go for it so Paul sometimes I'll be playing because I've got good technique I could just play a lot of stuff or play well without making it look like I was doing anything at all you know and he wasn't having that he wants to see you sweat he wants to make sure that you look like you're trying you know and he was just like yeah yeah it sounds all right but he said he'd come up to me and he'd go is this a podcast or a book a video? it's a podcast you can say whatever you like yeah go on so you can just tell them what I'm doing with my yeah. face right? he'd come up to me and he'd go come on come on like that in my really close and I'd be like oh my god help mum <laughs> <laughs> but I'm Caribbean, right? So I'm used to sort of proper, in my house, the banter used to flow, man. You couldn't be kind of shy and quiet, you know? Yeah. If he'd come back to me, come up to me and go, oh, come on, go on. I'd be like, yeah, all right then. You know? <laughs> you know, just stepping up, kind of, all right, you know. But it was quite intimidating, but he sort of egged you on to sort of dig in and find more passion and more commitment to the part and really give it like, you know, don't just dial it in. Play it like you mean it all off, off, you know. And I didn't want to go, so I, just, I wanted to stay. <laughs> so I was like, all right, so I want to keep my job. I've got to basically sweat and bleed because my fingers, right, some, I didn't really have the, like I said, I wasn't really a digging in kind of player because back then, the sort of when, when I was raised, the 80s kind of thing, bases were really quite high up on the body and everyone's been all sort of polite. They had these jackets on their sleeves rolled up and all of that, you know, <laughs> yeah. trying to be Mark King maybe a little bit or if they were playing slap because I used to love playing slap as well. So my bass was quite high up. It's all very neat. It's like you can dance, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Look cool, man. Paul just like, he said to me, why you got your bass up so high for? What do you think you want to be? Mark King? <laughs> and I went, what? No. So then I'm like, oh, I better drop my bass down because I don't think he likes it. And he came up to me and he went, that bass, what's that switch doing? Does it turn off that active pickup? And I went, yeah, it didn't. It just, it was a mid-range boost, but I just lied and said it did, right? And he went, well, turn it off then. So, oh, all right then. So, <laughs> so, so yeah, there I was not able, not used to digging in because I had a different style of playing. I'm sort of really giving it some every night. And you get these, uh, before you get your calluses, you get blisters. And so they started to form. You know, they used to book the gigs like quite deep, you know, like five, four in or whatever. I wasn't used to that either. It's my first tour, proper tour. 
So these blisters would break, you know, <laughs> and they used to find another finger to use to avoid heels, but you couldn't, I couldn't do it. So I ended up playing on the broken blister and every bass player has these stories and then it bleeds. Oh my goodness, man. Yeah. <laughs> another one forms and then that, but, and you've got blood bliss, playing on a blood bliss is so disgusting. So I actually ended up learning how to care for my fingers so I could, could cope. But it was actually really painful, you know. So all of that, and then I never moaned about it. I never told anyone, never went, oh, my fingers, you know. Yeah. I didn't want to get fired, you know. And, <laughs> and I didn't want to be a wimp, you know, because I was the only girl. Well, and actually, Helen was in the band then. But, yeah. you know, it's rhythm section. It's a very different thing from keyboards, you know. I wanted to keep up with Steve and I wanted to keep up with Paul and everyone. So I just sort of got on with it really and it really toughened me up and taught me what was important maybe your comfort isn't always important maybe sometimes you just got to sweat a bit and make your fingers bleed a little bit and you know just sort of make the music sound amazing and then cry later <laughs> <laughs> when you're on your own when you're back in the hotel room, yeah. that's when you cry Not in front yeah, of Paul. Yeah. I love that that's brilliant I mean this was a really special time for me because I discovered Paul my discovery of Paul was through that oh yeah that first solo album you know I was seeing gigs around that time it was my first proper like music experience is out on my own. You know, I did the Wildwood tour, I did Stanley Road, I did Heavy Soul, all those things. So I'd have seen you guys. And the great thing is some of it's captured on both on film and on records. So we get this Livewood album. This would have been 1994, September 94, Paul's first solo live album. And there's all kinds of gigs from like the Royal Albert Hall. We'll have to talk about playing the Royal Albert Hall. That must have been very special. Paradiso in Amsterdam. And it's mainly tracks from that first solo album and Wildwood. But we also get these covers, these snatches of cover versions, which I wanted to talk to you about. So this was also my introduction to many of these songs, which I love. I love this idea that you kind of introduce new things and or old things, but for the first time. So Bull Rush, he'd play, which would go into Magic Bus, The Who. Then we get, um, remember how we started, which would go into Domino's, um, which is this, you talk about jazz funk, like this proper old jazz funk. So it couldn't sound any different from your version to, to you know, that you were playing with Weller to the original. And then Can You Heal Us Holy Man, which is just an amazing tune. But we go into War, the Motown classic. I mean, that must have been so cool to be part of the band at that bit, that period, because he doesn't do that kind of stuff so much now. But that was really cool. I loved all that. Yeah, it was, it was nice to be playing some of that R&B stuff, you know, because that's not the music I was raised with. I didn't know a lot of the guitar led stuff as much we didn't have a lot of Hendrix and stuff in the house just a bit but it was definitely part of my background to be playing some R&B and you know Paul surprised me I didn't really know anything much about him because I wasn't you know following people in those days as a fan of anyone in particular Mm. I learned a lot about his taste in music that it was really oriented uh, towards black originating music but mostly American that was interesting for me because I did know of the jam, but just didn't know the tunes, you know. In my circle back then, you know, I was around my own culture a lot. So mostly black people I was around. So all the music I used to do was black music, black American music, black Caribbean music, black British music. When I realised that he knew more about the genre that I was raised in than I did, and he realised I didn't know hardly anything because I only had a narrow listening experience, he would go out be shopping because he's a bit of a shopper, Paul. That's close. I think you probably know that. Yeah, yeah. Know that. It's come up a couple of times, yeah. Right. There you go. And records, so, right? Yeah. Right. So that's the thing. He'd record shop some jeans he'd be out buying or some nice sort of like polo shirts and stuff. He'd come back with a couple of CDs or something. And he gave me loads of stuff. He just said, oh, I bought this for you, yo. I thought you might have this. I didn't have any of it. He bought me Curtis Mayfield. My first Lion Family Stone albums is what Paul gave me. You know, the first one, Fresh, that he gave me. I put that on it blew my mind. Because it was just raw, like rock music, but funky, like James Brown, but more kind of like attitude than, uh, you know, more song based and kind of more what I was familiar with with Paul stuff, the 60s mm. sound. But then with the funk element and the drumming style and everything, it was just like fantastic. And he gave me a kind of unintentional, maybe it was intentional, kind of education. Because, you know, remember the age I was. I mean, I work in colleges and I'm working with people that age 20, 21, 22. It's a young age. You know, there's mm. not a lot of time gone into absorbing all of yeah. your experiences at that point. So I had a lot to learn. And what a person to learn from. Do you know what I mean? Good and bad. <laughs> don't do drugs, kids. Don't drink too much alcohol, kids. But listen to funk music. And, you know, I remember sitting with Paul and the boys in a room and he put Hendrix on. Or I put Hendrix on. And we were listening to, I don't know what we were listening to, probably Crosstown or something classic. But anyway, he said, I've got to switch it off. And I was like, oh, what's up? And he said, sometimes he said, when I listen to music like this, I think that it will never be as good as this again. 
feels like that it's so special that if I listen to it, it makes me feel a little bit, but no one was ever going to make music as good as they did back then. That's what he said. I was wow. really moved by that. And I remember yeah. that because um, it just showed me that with all of the sort of egging on on stage and being so sort of blokey in general with his attitude towards how to perform, which was with so much energy and no room for any sort of shrinking violets on stage with Paul, but he's very sensitive as mm-hmm. well to things and that sort of statement, things like that really showed me that he was a very sensitive person as well. Well, look, we'll get onto some of the recorded stuff in a sec because people should know which tracks they can hear you on as well. But I have to ask about some of the characters. So you mentioned Whitey on drums, obviously as part of the band then, Helen Turner on keys, we got Craddock on guitar. But there's other characters in this mix as well. So let's talk about some of these people like Kenny Wheeler and Dave Liddell, bless him, the late, great Dave Liddell, who was the guitar tech and played fabulous lead guitar on Fifth Season, would come out and play with you guys (laughs) on stage. But also John Weller. So tell me about your memories of the the band members and the memories of the crew as well. they all like to be around. Drum tech Dodge. Dodge Aspinall, yeah. Yeah, and um, Seamus on, on monitors. Loved uh-huh. him. Andrew on front of house. He's still there now, I think, Andrew. Is he? Yeah, I think oh, so. Oh, yeah. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, I just um, got on really well with crew. I think they were really sweet to me, you know, Alf on, on lights. I mean, yeah, Alf Samet. In fact, we, we stay in touch, me and Alf online, you know, she's lovely on, on socials. Less so with the others, but I do occasionally, we do like each other's posts. So that's <laughs> nice, very supportive. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I, I got on really great with everyone, really. I mean, there's only the odd occasion that there would be difficulties, you know, and I, I don't really want to focus on too much of that sort of stuff. Did you play cards with John Weller? No, I mean, it was warned. <laughs> I was going to off your back not to do it. So I, and also I didn't have any skills and I, I knew I would lose everything I had. When there was a bit of a PDs kind of, uh, you get your PDs all at once at the at once a week and a lot of people would lose their PDs back to the person who gave them to them. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was quite funny. So I would observe this. There was one time, I don't know if I should tell this story, but I think it's probably so far time past, it doesn't really matter. Hopefully it won't. So Kenny used to be a little bit tricky for me at times, you know. He used to like playing this card game. He would sometimes lose all of his PDs to John, you know. But we had Andy Mack, who was the head. Oh, of course, the Go Discs boss, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to track him down for the podcast and I haven't managed it at all yet. He's very, I, don't, I think he's disappeared off the face of the earth, but yeah. Oh, nice. Probably with all his millions somewhere on some Caribbean <laughs> island, doesn't he? Yeah. yeah, right. Exactly. He felt like a big, big shot back then as well. Um, <laughs> So he was on the bus with us and he, it was, it was Monday night cards, you know, PD night, you know, PD night. I love that. that John, John's paying everybody and then basically winning, winning all that. It's it's <laughs> More for them for sitting down at the table with us. Yeah. yeah. So, so Andy gets in on this card game, right? And he managed to get all of Kenny's PDs off him. <laughs> I know. It was hilarious. And then the next day I'd heard about this because I wasn't watching. Andy came up to me and he gave me 500 quid. And he said, that's from Kenny. Go and buy yourself a nice dress. <laughs> oh, brilliant. I wonder, <laughs> I wonder if Kenny knows that. That's a fabulous story. <laughs> well, he'll maybe know about it now. But yeah, I was so chuffed. I didn't tell him. I was just like, oh, wow, this is so sweet. I don't even need to talk about this, man. It just feels so damn good. <laughs> oh, oh, uh, so recording with Paul, a different experience. I would imagine being in the studio. So the first song you worked together on the studio was Hung Up, which was a single, but then became part of the Wildwood re-release album. Yes. Then Out of the Sinking. And then we have to sort of Stanley Road. So Paul's biggest selling solo single goes gold. It's probably platinum by now. It's Paul Whitey, Helen Turner and you. It is You Do Something to Me. Tell me what it's like working with Paul in the studio. And let's talk about that song because that has come up on the podcast as so many people's favourites, I have to say. People love that song. Do you know what? I had a really funny experience where I was with these musicians out on a, on a gig. I don't remember what the gig was or who even the musician was. We were just talking and it was one of those gigs where you you just sort of meet up the day before and then you go out and you just rehearse and you just do the gig or maybe no rehearsal. So I didn't know these people very well, maybe. And uh, we were in a shop supermarket, I remember, in a shopping centre, I remember that. You Do Something To Me came on the PA and I went, I'm on that track. <laughs> and one of the musicians, one of the musicians turned around and went, you're kidding, that's my favourite song. And he got on his knees and he went, you know, just joking, you know, got on his knees and went, oh my God, I've got to hold your hand. I can't <laughs> believe it. Oh my God, this is so great. I was like, oh, that's cute. And that was really nice. And I kept on, not, not things like that, but stuff like that kept happening where I experienced musicians who I wouldn't have expected telling me that they, how much they loved that song. 
and I can't take any credit for it. It's a beautiful song. I just played the bass. And there was a guy with bass on the track, and Paul did do the demo most of the bass parts. I play the way I play. He plays the way he plays. So, yeah, I made it my own. But he wrote the part. I probably did the ghost in the um, company in the melody. We were in the manor. It was residential. She's always nice because you, you together, you know, you get a chance to play and hang and eat and joke and socialize and walk if you want or just be quiet and have a room disappear i always love residential studios for recording and it's i'm lucky to have had a few experiences like that with bands that was the first one paul demos his songs well you know he knows what he wants i think he demos the songs at that point he was demoing the songs with steve bite because he i don't think he would play in drums uh, and then when it came to recording you know i'd listen through we'd talk chords figure out the parts but if there was a clear bass line I'd just learn it and being a bass player in his heart as well as a guitarist and the songwriter he had very clear strong ideas so they're his parts um I just added my feel my placement to it which is you know we all, my, we all have a unique voice he's not particularly intense and he wouldn't work us too hard I don't remember being worked really hard I remember the atmosphere being same as normal sometimes a bit intense <laughs> sometimes a little bit like hey man just take a take a chill pill just don't, <laughs> don't be meditating or something you know but no it wasn't unpleasant we were very efficient we got what we needed to get done done i mean to be quite honest it was a bit of a dodgy time for me right then because i did those three days maybe i'm not sure i think we did pretty much everything i played on the album in those three or four days or what it was and I think we left from there. Oh, yeah. I can't remember the specifics, actually, but I do remember that we had to do Phoenix Festival. Right. And it was, I think it was a headline. So we broke the recording up to go and do this Phoenix Festival. Paul and I had a confrontation that he instigated, and I just decided I had to leave after right. that. Wow, okay. But I, do ha- I did have to go back to the studio and do some more. So that's it, yeah. There was a little bit more to do with me having decided I was leaving. Oh, but I couldn't <laughs> but I couldn't leave and drop the minute because yeah. we'd have the studio booked and I had was committed to the dates I'd agreed to. But I knew I was gonna leave and I was feeling awful about like not being able to just throw my base down, well no, place it gently and leave just in you know, but I had to fulfil my commitments first because I'm I'm a strong believer in honouring your agreements as much as you can. Sometimes you have to break them, but that one I was able to fulfil. As soon as I finished the take <laughs> and we came out for a break and I was done for the day, oh, that done for that little bit, I said, Paul, I'm not coming back, mate. So that Stanley Road experience is tinged with a, I left at the start of the recording. Yeah, that's why I'm only on three tracks. Right. But you come back to play heavy soul stuff live, right? So you must have fixed yeah. it. You, re- you repair your relationship, right? When I left in 94, I then, you know, Life goes on. Let's do another sessions. You know, met my new partner, had a kid, ninety six. You know, just grown up a little bit more. I was able to sort of know more about what I was prepared to put up with and who I was as a person and all of that. And going back was interesting. It's not quite the same person I was at twenty three. You know, <laughs> so we had a couple of little clashes, me and Paul. But he showed me respect for standing up to him, which is quite funny. You know, sort of. I I protested about his accusation one day after a gig that we were shit. <laughs> or, or, or it was shit, not us. He wasn't having a go directly at us. He wasn't saying we were shit. He was saying it was a shit gig. I was like tired of the, the sort of like stuff like that. I was not putting up with it. You know, I'm, I'm even worse now. I won't put up with Jack now, man. I'm like, don't <laughs> trouble me with your personal problems. Go and see a therapist. Okay. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, but back then I wasn't quite as direct. <laughs> so he was like, oh, he was a shit gig. I said, oh, but well, I had a good gig, Paul. And maybe you had a shit gig, but I had a good gig. I think it's because he said, oh, I'm paying you enough, you know, so, you know, you should be playing better and all that. And I said, well, I actually had a good gig. I think maybe you had a shit gig, but I thought it sounded really great. So, and the room, my God, it was silent. It was one of the bus, I said, it was silent. Everyone was like, gulp, waiting <laughs> for some fireworks, you know. And then I said, and if you don't like it, you can fire me. So don't ever go. You know, I mean, it wasn't easy. I was shaking in my shoes when I did it, but I hadn't planned it. It just came out like that. I just, you know, wanted to say, stop, you know, treat me a little bit more like a human being. I'm not staff, you know. And it worked because after that, he spoke to me. He said, I really respect the way you stood up to me on the bus. <laughs> I imagine it's quite hard to stand up to the front man, stand up to the, the leader of the band in that way, right? Yeah, I've been around many, many 
uh, situations where, you know, I've, got, I've had many bosses, let's say, and I've witnessed this stuff where a boss, their presence in the room can be so strong, you know, and their mood can really in- affect the room to such an extent that all the adults in the room are kind of treaded on eggshells a little bit and watching to see the lay of the land before they speak. Or Paul wasn't the worst one that I've had in terms of that kind of thing. Um, he was much more personable. I mean, he was one of the few artists I worked with who was the boss that would actually phone me directly. You know, all right, yeah, it's Paul. A lot of artists I wouldn't even meet maybe until... In fact, I'm, one artist I met on stage at Soundcheck of the first gig. Wow. Blimey. Yeah. So things like that go on. And Paul was much more... I liked the fact that I could actually speak my mind with him, but he was rare. Most of the time I was just a session yes person as well, like everyone else. There was an amazing space with Paul and and obviously with people like, you know, Robbie Williams and Mick Jagger and um, Dave Stewart, some of the, you know, the amazing artists that you've worked with and played with and stuff. You've been all around the world and with Paul, we were heading to the US, Europe, Japan. That must have been terribly exciting to travel the world as well. Yeah, I'd only ever been, I had been on a plane. I'd been to the Caribbean with my mum. We used to go quite often when I say that, I mean, not once every three years or something. So I had some experience traveling with her, but I hadn't actually had proper holidays. They were, they were always home from home. So we just go to the Caribbean, stay in a very modest place and end up doing housework. You know, it wasn't, <laughs> so it wasn't glamorous. You know, my idea of traveling was, was not fun, glamorous. Uh, so my first experience of actually flying out anywhere other than just going to Germany or something was, was poor. And so, yeah, I, I hadn't played South Pacific. I hadn't uh, been to Japan. Uh, I hadn't been to the States. No, I hadn't been anywhere apart from a bit of France and Germany. Germany, I was there all the time with some of the earlier bands I'd been with because it was I had a good funk soul scene then. But yeah, it was amazing. I went to Japan. I mean, it might sound a bit sort of what you're talking about, but Japan was less Western in the 90s. It sounds like it wasn't that far away, the 90s, but it's, it's 30 odd years now. Yeah, I know. It's mad, isn't it? Yeah. I forget because the 90s feels like yesterday. So <laughs> yeah. <I> mean, <laughs> What do you mean? No, that can't be that long ago. Sorry, you mean not. I'm a hundred years old? No. <laughs> so yeah, I went there and I had no experience of eating Japanese food. I found it really like I didn't like it. I couldn't use ch- chopsticks. Uh, it was awkward, you know. I used to beat the food with my fingers, you know. Avoid noodles at all costs, you know. <laughs> get, Everything's you get right. nice. rice, right? Base, yeah. And, yeah, and I sort of learned how to use them sort of slowly and become more worldly and well, well traveled. But I was so green. I didn't know how to hang with the boys. I didn't know how to hang with artists like Paul. I didn't know how to, you know, the food thing was weird for me. I was eating Caribbean food and a bit of British, you know, stuff, chips and things. I didn't have that kind of palate to sort of experience life the way that people have now it's everything's everywhere now but it, everything was more exciting in some ways because you would discover things that you couldn't get anywhere else or see anywhere else and it would be brand new and that now feels like it's kind of gone you have to go into deeper deeper territory more sort of far-flung places to get those unique experiences now and you watch you look you're at the pyramids of geezer and there's a mcdonald's when you get off the tree ups you know it's yeah, like, oh, yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> but that, that, that stuff wasn't quite as prevalent then yeah it was amazing experience traveling with him and i got the bug too i used to buy records go well in japan i used to get records that you couldn't get anywhere else you know i discovered that through paul my experience in that band i mean i'm still friends with steve white we still speak. We did some workshops together fairly recently. He's lovely, hasn't changed, still great. And um, yeah, it was an amazing experience. Hey, there's a couple of other artists I want to talk about you working with. Carleen Anderson, and I'll come back to that in a bit because mm-hmm. this was all linked to Paul as well. And, and Matt Dayton joins Paul's band and stuff. So I'll ask you a couple of questions about that in a sec. But I, I, we have to talk about what's now because the Project PH seems like a really exciting project. This is your thing. And it's quite unique from what I understand in the sense that it's not all kind of prearranged. You go with your heart is what I've kind of understand of this so far. So tell me about this, this Project PH and, and where we're going and what the idea is. Yeah, well, funnily enough, it actually brings me back to um, with working with Paul, uh, Foot in the Mountain. Oh, yeah. Uh, that kind of, that Glastonbury performance, 94. Oh, my um, God, that did, is epic, yeah. Yeah, we did Foot in the Mountain, and it was never really a fully fledged song as such. It was more like a jam, in yeah. a way, with a couple of sections, you know, that Paul would kind of cue. It was never fixed. And it was one of the first experiences I ever had of being in the sort of headlights with everyone sort of hanging on your every note, but nothing we, not much we were doing was pre-planned. And it came from a soundcheck jam. 
he already had the song idea basis of it. We didn't write anything as a band, but in terms of working on the tune, we just did it in soundcheck one day and something came from it. It was based on all the personalities and the characters in the band. He didn't tell me what to play. He didn't tell me what bass lines to play. Steve was a free agent. And we just basically gradually evolved the tune into becoming a thing that was very specific to the musicians on that stage at that time. Oh, I love and that. And wow. watched that evolve. And I learned, I didn't realise how much I'd learned from that. Because that, what he did with that song and how we played it is what I do with my band. Every night is different. Yeah. Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah. Unless it's a, a specific kind of single type song where I've written a, it's a sort of song that you can release as a single. Yeah. It's got a very fixed arrangement. I've got a few like that, but not that many. Only two or three out of 18 to 20 something we've got now. Most is, of them, there not, is there not scope for this to go horribly wrong? Though? I don't, because I, you know, I, I'm not a musician. I've got a guitar in the corner that I, I'm starting to get my head around and starting to kind of noodle about with, but you know. Presumably, like there's a there's a bit about being in a band where you develop that sixth sense and you start to know where each other's going. You can follow and stuff, but is it just practice, practice, practice? Is that how it, how we get there? Yeah, it's like you say, it's that familiarity, you get used to each other's body language. But I'm a very, very strong band leader. You know, I, I cue so directly. Bass head stop goes up, comes down. You know, you can't miss it. I'll stare at the drummer until he looks up. You can feel the heat in my stare. And then he looks up and he's like, oh yeah, she's definitely looking at me for my attention. Once I've got the drummer's attention, then I'll cue things. I'll hold my fingers up and do four like that. So then they know it's four bars or four beats till we're going to go. Or, or sometimes uh, it's getting to the point with my drummer where I'm thinking of cueing and he knows that I'm thinking of cueing and he knows where I am. And it's ridiculous. Wow, this is like a Laurie Lowe. He's a <laughs> stunning, stunning musician and a great drummer, great drummer, but his musicianship is amazing. Paul and Steve developed a relationship a bit like that where they were reading each other without doing anything. If you were looking, you wouldn't see them reading each other, but they would be, and it was almost telepathic. You get like that with musicians when you bond. So I'm bonded with my band, and so we basically work really well together with this sort of semi-improvisational thing. But it's funk-based, and it's groove-based, and then some of it's fusion as well. Yeah, it's working out really well with my uh, compositions that are coming to life in their hands, and I'm really excited about it. Wow, this sounds brilliant. And are you singing as well, or playing bass, band leader, and singer, or mixing it up? Or what? It's evolving. I have two singers, but they're not always with us. It's evolving. I just did something the other day, yesterday or the day before, in rehearsal that the band hadn't heard before. They were all a little bit shocked by it. It's, I'm going to keep it under wraps. I'm doing a lot of speech stuff, sort of a bit of poetry, and I'm going to start singing eventually. I'm just getting myself there because I like playing bass. When you're singing and playing, it's hard. You can't really get into the bass as much as I like to when I'm singing. So, yeah, but I will be singing, yeah, eventually, yeah. But I've got two strong singers, so luckily, if I don't fancy it, they can handle it, you know? And ambition is to do an album. So tell me about this. So this is uh, like a Kickstarter project you've got going on. Raising money to basically pay for promotion and recording. We've done about six tracks already. It's all paid for. But it's not mixed yet. I've got some vocals to record. And then we want to, you know, a lot of the time when you've got a product, you've got an album, a lot of musicians sort of flop at the point at which they try to get it out to people. It's the marketing that's the hardest bit, right? Yeah, the hardest bit. Yeah, we can all record at home in our bedrooms now. So the difficulty is actually how to promote it. And you need help. You need financing to do that usually, because if you try and do it on your own, you end up not playing your instrument and it's difficult. We've got this budget to finish the recording the album and to promote it properly. And I intend to, at the moment, I'm planning on releasing it independently on my own label because I've got probably three albums worth of material. So I'm prepared to sort of release the first one on my own so that I'm not waiting for anyone to sign me because I think I'll be waiting a long time to sign a 51-year-old woman. You know what I mean? It's like no one wants to sign somebody my age and playing sort of semi-jazz funk fusion. It's like, yeah, right, whatever. Go it's nice to being in control play. of your own destiny as well, though, isn't it? Like you can yeah, like, yeah, yeah, I can play. We can write exactly what we want. There's no, there's no taste police. We can do be as bad taste as we want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's great taste. It's beautiful taste. You know, if they like it and they want to, anyone wants to sign us, then I've got more material and I could pursue that option if I wanted. But I like the idea of being independent. If I can stay independent, my plan is to do that. Well, good luck with that. That sounds terribly exciting. We'll share all the links in the show notes and stuff like that and support that too as well. Right. So a couple of things I have to ask you about before we go. So Carleen Anderson, Blessed Burden. This was like a Weller produced project, but there are other people involved like Brendan Lynch, we should mention, who obviously produced, you know, all those early Weller solo albums as well. Matt Dayton, who joined the Weller band at that point. White is involved. So tell me about Carleen because she's 
again, such an amazing talent. Yeah, I mean, I saw her when she was a guest at the JB's at the Town and Country Club, now the Forum in Kentish Town. She was amazing, stunning. She just came out and just blew the roof off the place, you know. And then I found myself years later on the same stage with her, which is amazing. But she was a guest with Paul, with his band. I think maybe it was one of the Jules Hollands or something like that. She mm. came on and did maybe a cover. I'm not sure which cover it was. It might have been a Curtis Mayfield tune or something. Okay, all sure. right, okay. Anyway, you know, met her there. Our paths crossed. And then Paul was producing the record, her record, and I got invited to be on bass, which was fantastic. And she was very much in charge, which felt amazing because I hadn't really had a female boss at that point. It was a fantastic consummate pianist, you know, and knows what she wants, cordially and all of that stuff. It was nice to watch a woman in that role, especially while I was young like that. I think it gave me a bit of a boost of confidence to eventually head into my own leadership role. And she's just so sweet and lovely. And then after we did that record, but it was kind of the Paul Carleen kind of, you know, collaboration. Then she was out on her own as an artist. And then she asked me to do her live band. So I ended up playing North Sea Jazz Festival with her, which was my first time playing there, which was amazing fun to do that and see those people. We were standing just at the backstage and this really famous musician called Joe Zawinor, who was the originator of Weather Report, came up and said, does anyone tell me the way to the stage? Sort of thing. And I'm looking at him going... Just as uh, so, so Joe Zawinul, oh my God, he's one step away from Jaco Pastorius, you know, who I'm a big fan of, the bass player from Weatherport. It was lovely that through Paul's connection, I ended up uh, working with Carleen and we're not mega in contact now, but yeah, on socials, we say hi to each other. Yeah, yeah well, I'm hoping she'll come on the podcast. She's working on a theatre project at the moment, which sounds really interesting. So I'm hoping she'll come on. Let's talk about Matt Dayton when he joined the band because he played on the Carleen Anderson album. He was part of that. Um, and Matt's been on the podcast. He's a lovely fella. I love that. He's brilliant. But <laughs> so you were part of the band when, they, when we were in Paris. So tell me about this. What happened? Well, tell um, us the truth. I, I stayed in London for a, a day longer. And um, so I arrived to with the venue for sound check from the train, I suppose I got the train. And it was like someone had died. And I was like, what's going on? They were like, Paul and Matt got arrested. And I was just uh, asking, whoa, whoa, what? Why? What happened? And they said, well, they got arrested for trashing the hotel. And I was like, are you serious? Well, like the 1970s or something. And they said, yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, God, really? So like, this story unfolded about what had happened, the fact that actually everything's pinned down in the hotel, you know, everything's screwed in. You couldn't just do things. So they... We didn't have to go for it, apparently. I wasn't there. So I don't like to tell stories that I wasn't there for. I wasn't there for that bit. But the bit I was there for was uh, just wondering whether this gig was going to happen. It was like, it might get cancelled because they haven't been released, you know. And then fairly towards the last minute, you know, they appear. But we were all in the dressing room now, sort of waiting to figure out what was going to happen. They'd been released. They walk in the dressing room. The dressing room's full of people, crew and all sorts. They both walk in. Door flings open. Everyone goes, way, and Paul and Matt go, I'm free, you know, like that, right? And it was all like, oh, well done, oh man, that's mental, blah, 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 blah. Everybody gradually sort of leaves to go and get ready for the gig, because they did actually play, I think, yeah. And then it was just me and a couple of other band and Paul and Matt. And then Paul comes up to me and he gives me a hug and he went, oh yeah, it was terrible, man. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you wimp. <laughs> Never, mind mind about, <laughs> Never mind about coming in cheering like some sort of, you know, sleeping <laughs> Alcatraz. You wanted his mum. <laughs> it was lovely though, because, you know, it was lovely because it was nice that he, he did give me a cuddle because, you know, it must have been a bit of a shitty experience, you know. Matt blamed it on Kenny Wheeler for falling asleep because he was meant to be looking after them. I'm like, and Kenny Wheeler was like... <laughs> Bollocks, what? It's not my job. Bloody hell. Daddy. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's all right. And then the other thing we have to talk about is Hans Zimmer. I mean, this is utterly ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously this, you know, massively famous, incredible composer of, of, you know, film music and scores and music producer. A couple of Oscars. I think there's four Grammys, you know, just a few things. And, yeah. and he's actually on the list of top 100 living geniuses that was in the Daily Telegraph, <laughs> which, oh. which is missing Paul Weller, but I'll let that slide, you know. Yeah, exactly. What the hell? Um, but we're talking about things like <laughs> Gladiator and um, the bits yeah. of the Lion King that weren't out on John, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean. I mean, incredible. And there we are, June soundtrack for this, which was a great film as well, I have to say. And you were part of the mix of that. It won an Oscar, it won a BAFTA, it won a Golden Globe for original score. I mean, wow. Yeah, yeah right. Nice. I mean, I was, um, I was in my bedroom 
with my and you can't see where I'm where I am now, right now. This is my, my bedroom basically. It's my studio bedroom. It's like not it's a decent sized room, but it's still only a little space, you know, it's got a corner. Yeah. You see my bases over there. Like oh wow, corner. look at all that. Oh my god, look at all that. Yeah, it's just sort of goes around. Um so I um I recorded the June soundtrack here. Oh, I was imagining you being in like a big room with the orchestra and all that, and it's all remote now, um, right? Well, it was during lockdown. We did it in twenty, ah, so okay. a bit in twenty, uh, twenty and twenty-one. It's finished off some stuff in twenty-one, but yeah, it was mostly Christmas twenty. I just set up my situation here. Fender's given me a lovely setup. You know, I've got my studio amp recording and a few pedals. They wanted a lot of grunge and grit, so I ended up using all these distortion settings and pedals, and I had some crazy things I had to try and do to make the sounds they wanted. You know. I would just record what they needed. They send me a score and mark which bars they wanted me to record. And I would um, just do a bunch of passes, see what they liked and the bits that they liked, they would use. I suppose they never, I don't think I did a week or one week or, but mostly I just threw it at it and they took it and it's on the soundtrack. And I'm really proud of the amount of inventiveness I had to do to create some of the sounds because it's bass, but it also is a lot of effective bass on that. A lot of heavy distortion and kind of whale song style stuff. I even played fretless, five string fretless and stuff that I don't normally do. The only thing I was missing, which I'm sad about, is I didn't have a Caleb Bridge, so I didn't have a tremolo arm. I would have loved to have had a tremolo arm on one of my basses because that would have been a beautiful thing to create an effect because I just wanted noise, you know? And I remember I put the soundtrack on and uh, the, my speakers were already on and I pressed go and this is after I put the bass on it. <laughs> I, there was about four bases on there, four people, different bass players at certain points. So I hit go on the on play and it just blew into my speakers and the cat just went <laughs> <laughs> and it did behind the sofa. It sounded like the devil, the heavy hell was opening up and the devil was emerging, you know, it was like proper darkness. But it was great fun. Yeah. It's a really amazing experience to have that much freedom to play yeah. on a soundtrack of that caliber. And okay. there's no I had no Taste police, no boss. They just said, just do what you want. This is what we want, kind of vaguely. And then I just went on the bass on it. You know, it's great. Love it, love it. Well, and sequel on the way because it was a terrific film. And there's a part two, obviously, coming soon because we've not yeah, finished the okay. story of that, right? So, yeah. um, so hopefully more to come. Hey, this has been so lovely, Yolanda. I've loved chatting with you. It's been an absolute joy. I have two final questions for you before you go. Okay, so you're allowed one Paul Weller song for the rest of your life. It can be the Jam, the Star Council, or so. I love the faces people pull now. Or solo. <laughs> What's it going to be? I just loved playing Into Tomorrow. Ah. It's so funky. I love playing that. I love the bass part, everything. So Into Tomorrow, yes. That's such a terrific, like, comeback song, wasn't it? It's like, announced oh, the no. arrival of Weller as a solo artist. What a yeah. tune. Oh. And then the uh, final question. So the purpose of this podcast is not least to talk to amazing people like yourself with these, these great careers, the experience and the connections with Mr. Weller. But the big regret in my life was that when I was a radio presenter, I never got to interview Paul. If that happens... And that's the idea. The final episode of the podcast series is me interviewing Mr. Weller. So it's got to happen. Come on, mate. Get in touch, Paul. Come on. Come on. Um, <laughs> if it happens, what should I ask him? Um, ask him how he feels about people mimicking him, his style, his look and his... Because uh, it's, it's got such a strong image and it's carried on through the decades, you know. And I wonder how he feels about, you know, people being so dedicated to him that they kind of adopt a lot of his style and his, how does he feel about that? I always wondered about how it feels for people to have fans that uh, are really dedicated like that. It must be quite strange looking at, and I don't know that it was so much during your era, but certainly in you know, the past 20 years, looking out on stage and what you see is a sea of well, well of haircuts. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I don't know what, if it tickles him or whether he likes it or not. I just wondered if anyone ever asks him that. Because um, nobody asks people, what is it like to be you? And uh, I'm curious about what it's like to be in Paul's shoes. Uh, there's so many questions I would ask him around that. Ex what's this experience like for you as a, not as a, you know, an artist, but as a human being? Because people forget you're a human being sometimes. You, you become an, a, a sort of cartoonish figure for them or something or an icon. And, but actually you're just a human being that's just got a familiar face. One that's so familiar you think you know them, but you don't, you know. Yeah. And so, also yeah. it's like the same things going on inside their heads that go on inside our heads. Those same, yeah. same doubts and fears and worries and concerns and troubles and happiness, everything yeah. else, right? It's like, yeah, exactly. you're, 
you're not a robot right and so yeah no, that's exactly. a, hey that's a great question i love it um, <laughs> hey this has been so lovely um i love chatting with you i've really enjoyed this so thank you so much for joining me yeah it's been fun i said more than i intended in general <laughs> but i felt relaxed and also i thought you know what these stories are all part of what makes me who i am and they're my stories to tell and i don't want to paint anyone in a bad light about any in any way and I have no problem with any of my own history. But it's good for people to know that, um, you know, we're all, we are all just human. And we it's not always glamorous and, and fun. Sometimes it's hard. But it's a price worth paying to get, you know, where you got to go. And I'm so glad I'm where I am right now because um, Paul helped to bring me here. My thanks once again to Yolanda Charles MBE for joining me on the podcast. Another very special chat. You can find more details in the show notes for this podcast on my website, paulwellerfanpodcast.com. On the page, you'll find a little playlist that we've put together, plus videos and details about Project PH, her latest band as well. If you've enjoyed listening, please do share this episode on your social media channels. It all helps to spread the word and make sure you follow and leave a review. Plus, you can buy me a virtual coffee or get some of our new exclusive official merchandise on my website, paulwellerfanpodcast.com. Get in touch on social media, on Twitter, at wellerfanpod, or on Instagram and Facebook, paulwellerfanpodcast. On the next episode of the podcast, we dig into the front cover of our favorite shop with photographer Ollie Ball, the man who created that cover with Paul, Mick and Simon Halfon. If you're a Star Council fan, you have to make sure you follow and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts to get it next. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.